Um, we're going to start uh, this morning in the book of Romans, and um, a little bit different format. I'm going to have, instead of doing a handout, we're going to have it up on the screen, most of it. Uh, you want to keep your Bible handy. You can either follow along in the book of Romans as we're reading there. That way you can make some notes or whatever if you need to. But then also, um, there's going to be some cross-reference and stuff like that that I just didn't feel like making a slide for. And there'll probably be some things along the way that I just kind of get added in impromptu. And uh, so we'll just kind of go along and do this as we go. Book of Romans is really interesting. Uh, we titled it From Faith to Faith because Paul mentions there in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, for therein, talking about the gospel, therein is righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And when he says it's from faith to faith, it's faith from beginning to end. That's the Christian life. And what the book of Romans does is it traces, it takes us through the Christian life from beginning to end. It explains the gospel, and then it shows us how the gospel applies to every aspect of our life. And we are going to go verse by verse through this, but we're not going to go nearly as in-depth on every verse as we might on a typical Sunday morning or something like that. And I, I think this will be tremendous for either a refresher, if you've been a Christian for a while, maybe a spiritual boost for you, hopefully, or even if you know, you're not quite where you think you should be, maybe this will kind of help provoke you to get there. And so I ask for some patience because this is, I'm just learning how to do some of this stuff, and this is all new when it comes to PowerPoint, uh, putting these together, making sure everything works, and trying to talk with the screen behind me and seeing it here and having my notes and stuff like that. So we're going to go ahead and get started. When we uh, get going here, we're going to try to cover the first 17 verses here in Romans chapter 1. And we're going to kind of talk about Paul's life and ministry and how he came to faith in Christ and then how his ministry got started. But when we come to the Word of God, we always come with this presupposition. We come with this knowledge. This is one of the advantages that we have. As it says there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's what is right, for uh, reproof, that's what's not right. For correction, that's how to get right. And instruction righteousness is how to stay right. And so we come with the understanding that all of the Bible, every word of it, is inspired by God. And so as we study the book of Romans, we are studying God's very words. This is something we want to keep in mind, not just when we're studying Romans, but anytime. These are God's words given to us. And we have every word of God. That's one of the wonderful benefits that we have as King James Bible believers. You know, I was, uh, there's a, uh, a man that I watch some of his videos and stuff on YouTube. And, and he's, he's a Reformed Baptist. He's not, he's not really our stripe, but he's, he's kind of the scholarly type. But he's a King James guy. And he, he traces, a, he talks a lot about the differences between the King James and the text that underlies our King James Bible and the critical text that underlies the new Bible version. So like the NIV and the New American Standard and the New King James and various things like that. And this next year, they're going to be coming out with a new Greek text for that they're revising the text that underlies the other versions of the Bible and they're coming out with a new one. They have to do one of these every so many years, sometimes every two to five years, something like that, a new edition comes out. And this year, in four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Acts, and Revelation, they are making 200 plus changes to the text. That equals out to be about two changes or more per chapter. Now, what a terrible way to approach the Bible not knowing what the text says. Now, that's this year. And that's because those four books, they've run through their process of uh, correlating the text together. 
But you know what that would do to me? Is when I come to the Bible, well, I'm pretty sure then that I know what Matthew says. I'm pretty sure I know what Mark says. I'm pretty sure I know what Acts says. I'm pretty sure what Revelation says. But the rest of the New Testament, I don't know until they come out with the next edition. Wouldn't that be a terrible way to live in having no assurance of what the Bible says? You know, we just trust that God has preserved his word as he said. Now, notice here in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, it says that these were more noble, that's the Berean Christians, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, now watch this, and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. Now, what scriptures are they studying? Well, at that time in church history, the only thing that there is is the Old Testament. Uh, there might have been the book of James. Uh, it, it's hard to tell for sure. But these Bereans have the scriptures, and what do they have? They have the Old Testament. Now, let me ask you this. Do they have the originals? And uh, they're, they're in Europe. Do they have the original writings of Moses? And how long ago was it that Moses wrote the Torah? About a thousand years prior to this. Maybe a little more. You know, what happens when you have a book that you use regularly? It wears out. So you have to make copies. You make copies of copies of copies of copies. And if there did happen to be any originals, it would have been in the temple in Jerusalem because that's where they were authorized to store authoritative documents that were going to be used for copying. So these Bereans, they are studying the Scriptures daily, and what they have is not the originals. They have copies of copies of copies, meaning that God preserved the word of God for them to have, and he calls it scripture. He's not calling the original scripture. Now, Romans is written about 57 to 58 AD, and Paul is writing from Corinth to Rome. Now, this here is where the region where Paul did most of his missionary work. You see Turkey there, that the central region there that's called Italia on the map there, that would be the region where Galatia was, and then over to the East there, uh, if you see Is Izmir, that would be the area of Asia Minor. But there where the red arrow is, that's where Corinth is. And that's where Paul was writing from, there in southern Greece. And right there is Rome, where Paul's writing to. You know, to us, that doesn't look so far. It's about 300 miles as the bird flies. But in Paul's time, this letter getting to Rome only had one of two options. They could take the sea and go by ship, which was treacherous. You remember in the book of Acts, as you get toward the end of the book of Acts, when Paul is being taken to Rome finally. As Paul's going to Rome, what happens? They fall into a storm. Eurachlodon, it's this uh, kind of a cyclone, hurricane-type storm. And, and this region in the sea was known for those type of storms. And so it was treacherous to go that way, and then if he were to go by land, it would be all mountainous, terrain going all the way around. So for us, we look at that and it's like, oh, you know, that's a couple hour trip maybe on, a, on an airplane. You're going to get up and then pretty much come right back down. But for them, this is days and weeks to make this type of a trip. So Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So who exactly is Paul? This is what we want to look at first. Who is he? Where did he come from? Well, you notice here in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, Paul is giving his testimony, and he says, I verily uh, am a man which am a Jew. So he's a Jew. Okay, I, I think most of us know that. But now watch this. It says he's born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, which is a region in Turkey, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. So now, the fact that he's born in Tarsus, one of the things we can gain from that is Paul, and Paul states it in Acts chapter 22 and verse 28 there, that he is freeborn. You see, a Jew, or somebody that was not necessarily Roman, they could achieve freedom... Uh, they could achieve liberty, in a sense, 
uh, through paying a great sum of money or somehow doing some type of an accomplishment to be recognized by the Roman Empire and therefore they could achieve uh, liberty and freedom and have the, all the rights and privileges of a Roman citizen. But somehow, Paul managed to be freeborn, which means his father or grandfather had somehow paid money or done some type of an achievement to be recognized where he achieved freedom for his family. And so Paul is born with all the freedoms and liberties of a Roman citizen, which is tremendous because now Paul is able to travel really without hindrance. Paul can go anywhere he wants to, and if he gets into trouble, he can claim his right as a Roman citizen that they're not allowed to prosecute him without a fair trial. That's a pretty good idea, having a fair trial for something like that. But notice here he says, uh, yet brought up in this city, this is Jerusalem. So Paul, though he was born in Tarsus, he was raised in Jerusalem. And, and this is going to become important here in just a moment. And, and he was brought up, his teacher, the rabbi that taught him, was a fellow by the name of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was the most conservative and the most revered and well-recognized rabbi of the time. And, and it, being taught by Gamaliel would be like being taught at Harvard or Yale or Princeton. It would be like the Ivy League type of school. So Paul had the best possible training that a Jew could have. And the fact that he's brought up in Jerusalem means that during the time of Jesus... Paul would have had some type of interaction with Jesus. And he would have, at some point, seen his ministry. He would have seen, uh, heard his teaching. He may have seen a miracle that was done. But he is in Jerusalem the times that Jesus comes through and does work in Jerusalem. And so Paul is somewhere in his 30s at this time. And notice here in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5, he circumcised the eighth day. Now, that was a big deal for the Jews because that's what the law required. But basically, what Paul's going to do here is he's going to establish the fact that he was the Jew of the Jew. He is the, as he says here, the Hebrew of the Hebrews. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. So his parentage was faithful Jews. They made sure that he was circumcised the eighth day. He's of the stock of Israel. He's uh, of the line of Jacob, as he should be. Uh, to be a Jew, he's of the tribe of Benjamin, which was a respected tribe. He's an Hebrew of the Hebrews, meaning that he's very, very religious. He's very religious. And as touching the law, it says a Pharisee. So this means he's one of the religious leaders. He's a judge for the Jews, Jewish people. He is a man that knows and understands the law. He's a ruler. He is an authority among the Jews, is what he was prior to his conversion. And so as Jesus comes into the city and is teaching, and the Pharisees are dealing with Jesus, Paul's aware of what's going on. And he's well aware. When they're trying Jesus for heresy and for blasphemy, Paul's around when this stuff is going on. So he's not unfamiliar. And now in Acts chapter 5, we have this persecution that's going on with the apostles. And the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, gather the apostles up, and they're trying to figure out how do we stop this Jesus business. And they're trying to figure out, well, you know, do we kill him? Do we threaten him? What do we do? And Gamaliel stands up, and he, he's intervening in this execution because he reminds the people that, guys, remember... There was a couple other instances like this where there was this Judas fella and he rose up and he drew away a bunch of disciples after him and they tried to do an insurrection and, you know, the Romans kind of put a squash on that and scattered them and they kind of came to naught and nobody's heard of them since. And there was another guy before him and he was killed and after he was killed, then all of his disciples kind of fizzled away. And so, you know, if this thing's of God, there's nothing you can do about it. And if this thing's of men, then it's going to be, an end is going to be put to it anyway, and things are going to just kind of go back to normal. We don't need to worry about this. Which, on his part, was tremendous wisdom, but uh, Paul wasn't exactly satisfied with this. Uh, you remember there in Acts chapter 7 and chapter 8, we have the episode with Stephen. Now, this is showing up, right? Okay, good. That would be terrible to be going through all this and 
you not be able to see any of it. But uh, it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, Paul is consenting unto his death. So Stephen is a deacon in the church of Jerusalem. And one day he's preaching, and it gets the attention of the Pharisees and of the people. And so they want to put a stop to him. And as they are interrupting his preaching, and they're telling him to stop, he begins to address the leaders and to say that they are just like their fathers and the father's fathers. And he gives this history going all the way back to, e to Israel coming out of Egypt, how Israel has constantly failed to listen to the warnings of the prophets. And every time God would deliver them, he would send them a prophet and give them a message, and the people would reject it and reject God and go into idolatry, and they would just kind of have this constant cycle of a little bit of victory for a while and then falling, kind of like the book of Judges. Well, finally, he gets to the end of his message, and he says, you are hard-hearted, you are stiff-necked, and you have killed the just one. You have put God <laughs> to death by putting him on a, on a cross. You killed your Messiah. Well, that was the last straw. Now, for the Jews, it was illegal for them to perform an execution. They had to go through the Romans. But as you can tell, as you read the scriptures, at this particular point, they had had enough. And Rome wasn't acting on their behalf, and so they're going to take matters into their own hands. And in Acts chapter 7, and verse 58, it says that the people that were executing laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. The fact that they laid their coats at Saul's feet means that Saul, who would be called Paul later, is the ringleader. He's the one that has authorized this execution. He's the one that is in charge. And here it says that Paul was, Saul was consenting unto his death. He was given the charge by the Pharisees to do this, He's the one organizing it, and so they stoned Stephen to death. And then it didn't stop there. It's kind of like a bloodlust that he gets after this point. He, you know, uh, it's kind of like dogs. You know, Rottweilers and Doberman Pinchers, I've, I've known some people that have had some, and I, I don't think I would ever get one, but they can be some of the most friendly and cuddliest dogs until they get the taste of blood and then it ch totally changes their demeanor. And then it kind of becomes like, uh, kind of like a drug, and each dose intensifies the effect. And that's exactly the way it was with Paul. The first he killed is authorizing the, the destruction of Stephen, and now after that, he continues to go on. It's not enough. Now we've eliminated one. Well, let's just keep going. And so this really becomes Paul's hobby for a while, and to kill Christians. And it says that Saul made havoc of the church, talking about the church in Jerusalem, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. So he's binding them and casting them into the prison. And later on, Paul says, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. So as Paul is searching out for these Christians, he's binding them with chains. He's tying them up in ropes. He's beating them. He's trying to get them to renounce their faith. He's punishing them. He's really making havoc of things. So let's get into Paul's testimony. How did he come to faith in Christ? Well, Galatians chapter 1 ta starts talking a little bit about this. He says there in verse 13, He have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Now watch this. And profited... In the Jews' religion, above many my equals, uh, in mine own nation, and watch this here, this last phrase, being more exceedingly zealous of the law. Is that what it says? The traditions of my fathers. See, now, Paul, prior to this, considered himself to be a Torah-observing Jew. But the problem was, is by the time you get to Jesus' ministry, what does Jesus say about the traditions of the fathers? They've made the commandment of God without effect by your traditions. Now, why is that so important? What is the purpose of the law? Paul's actually going to tell them in Galatians chapter 3, and we'll talk about it more as we get farther into Romans. 
He's going to tell them in Galatians chapter 3 that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. That's the purpose of the law. It was to show people their need for a Savior and to kind of carry them along and point them to the Messiah when he comes. But the problem was, by the time you get to Jesus' ministry, they had so covered over the law of God with traditions that the traditions then became the law, and now when the Messiah shows up, they fail to recognize him. And that's exactly the way it is with religion today, is it not? People want to do all these good works, and what do they do? They kind of make their own law up as they go and think that somehow that's going to make them acceptable with God. But if it doesn't bring you to Jesus, then it's all vain. It's unprofitable. It is of none effect. And so this is what Paul means later on in Romans when he says, do we make void the law through faith? Nay, we establish the law. What does that mean? That means we have brought the law, we have fulfilled the law and its purpose to bring us to Christ, to bring us to the point of faith. So Paul was exceedingly zealous of the traditions, not of the law. If Paul was zealous of the law and its rightful intent, he would have recognized his Messiah very early on. Here in Acts chapter 26, he says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So he, he's seeking out this job, this job of killing Christians. This is one of those things he's laid down and thought, you know, I need to do something about this. I'm just going to kill them all. Romans won't take care of them. The rest of the Jews aren't doing much about it. I'll just, I'll take it upon myself to do it. So I thought that with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing also I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints, watch this, did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. That's what Paul was doing with Stephen. And verse 11 here, and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly mad against them. That means he's gone crazy, and I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So he compelled them to blaspheme. He would go into the synagogues and he would begin a process of torture. He would beat them with whips. He would beat them with rods. He would punch and kick them. Uh, and pretty much anything that a person could imagine to do, this is what Paul is doing for the specific purpose of trying to get these Jewish people to renounce this Messiah that they claim has come. He's trying everything that he can do, trying to get them to blaspheme and deny Christ. But still, that wasn't enough. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 there says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and, what's that word? Slaughter. So he, he's torturing them, and if they don't renounce Jesus Christ, what happens? He just keeps going until they die. He's not concerned about it. He says, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if, any, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So Paul has made havoc of the church in Jerusalem, and the disciples are being scattered in Acts chapter 8. But now in Acts chapter 9, he finds out, hey, there's some of these disciples that made their way up to Damascus. I'm going to go there. There's a synagogue up there, and I'm going to go up there. And so he goes and he gets letters from the chief priest that authorize him to go. And so he goes up to Damascus. And what's his point? What's he planning to do? To threaten and to slaughter them. That's what he, his plan is. In Acts chapter uh, 26 here, as Paul is giving his testimony again, he says, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king... I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, now watch this, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou my people? Is that what he said? No, why persecutest thou me? Now who was Saul persecuting? Who was Saul going after? He's going to Damascus for what purpose? 
to kill Christians. And Jesus, when he appears to Saul, he says, why are you persecuting me? Now, this is such a wonderful truth. This is how connected we are to the Lord Jesus. This is how closely he relates to you and I. We are not only his brethren. We are not only in the family of God. We are his body. And so anytime somebody persecutes us, who are they really persecuting? They're persecuting Christ. That's what Jesus told the disciples. He says, they're not, re they're not rejecting you. When you go and they don't listen and they don't believe you, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And so Jesus identifies with his disciples. But he says, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Pricks, that's a, an ox goad, uh, a stick that they would, we're familiar with this, it's kind of like a little, uh, you know, those little taser things that they would use on cattle, a cattle prod, and prod them along. That's what a prick is. This is, this is what Paul's feeling. He's feeling and experiencing this conviction, this prodding of the Holy Spirit. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things, which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So Christ has been drawing him. This whole time, Christ has been working in Paul. And he's, as he's persecuting these people, I, I really don't think that these people were silent about who Jesus was. Not only did he hear the preaching prior, but it's been the testimony throughout all of history as the martyrs are being put to death. You know, what else, what do you have to lose to keep silent? Let's just <laughs> give the gospel. And so these people, as they're being tortured, they're not renouncing their faith in Christ. Rather, they're praising him because they know that this suffering that they're enduring is only for a moment, and it, it's going to lead way to far greater glory in the end. And Paul's hearing this, and it's really affecting him. In fact, I think probably as Paul is on the road, he's struggling because he knows that this is true. He's just, he's just not ready to give up his tradition. There's so many people like that. Though, in fact, that's the hardest peop, group of people to witness to sometimes, is the religious people. Because they have their mind made up, and even though they come to a point where they're, they know in their mind that they're wrong, it's just there's been so much tradition. This is what I believed all my life. And I'm not ready to give that up. And that's exactly where Paul was, but God really interrupted his plans. He's riding on his way up to Damascus, and he comes down and knocks him right off the horse. And he's going to send him now as a Jew that hates Gentiles. Paul is now going to go to the Gentiles and be the missionary, the apostle to the Gentiles. So back to Romans chapter 1. Verse 1, Paul, a servant call of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separate unto the gospel of God. So what do we find here? He's a servant. Now, this is exactly what we all are as believers. We're servants of Jesus Christ. This is inherent in the command that we're to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. This is what it means for Jesus to be Lord, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That means that he is supreme. That means he's above all else. And that means that I am his servant. And Paul understood this. This is what Paul was before he ever became an apostle. He is a servant of Jesus Christ. Secondly, notice he's called to be an apostle. Apostle is what he did. That was his vocation. But he was called by Jesus to do this. Jesus appeared to him and said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. The Holy Ghost told the church at Antioch, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. This isn't the work that Paul chose for himself. This, this isn't like the mission that he had to kill Christians prior to his conversion. Now, as a Christian, he didn't take it upon himself to get into the ministry. He waited specifically until God told him, this is what I am calling you to do. And it's a good thing God called him. Because I don't know about you, but there's times where I make decisions for myself, and I get into it, and after a little while it gets rough, and I thought, think, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea. I'll just stop and do something else. 
you know what? For the most part, that's okay when it's your decision. But when you know, this is what God has called me to do, and God has told me to do this, and God is the one that authorized me to do this, God is the one that commissioned me, God is the one that prepared me for this, then it really doesn't matter how hard it gets, I can't stop because this is God's plan and purpose in my life. And so this is exactly where Paul was. Now, you don't choose this type of stuff for yourself. And as an apostle, Ephesians chapter 4 says that as an apostle, he is a gift to the church for the perfection of the saints. Now, did Paul help perfect the saints? Absolutely. Three times as much as he evangelized, he's perfecting the saints. And as a pen by, used by God to write down the scriptures for us, Paul is used by the saints to, give a, to edify and to build up and perfect the saints. And then he's separated unto the gospel of God. Paul's calling as an apostle is unique. And we'll address this more as we go into the book of Romans. But his, his calling as an apostle to the Gentiles is unique. You see, the other apostles, they pretty much remained in Israel for the majority of their ministry. It wasn't until later that they start spreading out. But the 12 stay in Jerusalem. But Paul had a primary ministry of going to the Gentiles and to him were committed certain mysteries that he revealed to us. And so he has a very unique ministry. And then uh, he, he's a world missionary. And he's all over the place. Paul goes everywhere. He goes throughout uh, Asia. He goes throughout Europe. He goes throughout Syria. He's in Israel a little bit. And he's everywhere. And as he's going along, Paul has this kind of tendency to stir the pot a little bit, to say the least. Pretty much everywhere he goes, either revival or riot or both break out. And this is exactly what's said here in Acts chapter 17, verse 6. As he's coming into Thessalonica and he's preaching there, uh, the, it says, when they found them not, talking about the apostles, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And they've been going everywhere. And that's kind of the testimony that they had. That's the rumblings that are going on through the Roman Empire, that there's some people coming in and they're causing all sorts of havoc. They're kind of turning the world upside down. We would look at it and say, actually, I think they're turning it right side up. But for the world, they see everything that we do is turning it upside down. And this actually happened. Notice it says they turned the world upside down. Now watch these next couple of verses here in Colossians. This is, this is so important. Paul mentions the word of truth here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. The word of truth of the gospel which has come unto you as it is in, what's that next word? All the world. Now, what did Paul mean? See, some people read that and they would say, well, you know, he meant the known world at that time. Well, is that what Jesus meant when he said, go ye, therefore teach all, and go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Is that what he said? Did Jesus just mean the known world at that time? No, he meant all the world. He meant every creature. And notice here, and, and you can tell Luke has the account of, that's recorded in Mark in his mind because he uses the exact same wording. It says, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. Watch verse 23 here. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. So just in case you don't understand what he means by world, he tells us it's every creature under heaven. So what is that? That's all the world. That means in the time that Paul, by the time Paul goes to prison at the end of the book of Acts, that means every single continent on this planet has received the gospel. And that's amazing. And we struggled just in the 20th century and 21st century to get the gospel to the world. But it happened in the days of Paul, and they didn't have airplanes, they didn't have automobiles, but they did have a fervent heart and a desire to reach the world and obey their Lord. And that only took 25 years. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Notice here, Romans chapter 1, verse 2, which he had promised. So this gospel is something that was promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. 
concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Let's look at some of these promises. What, was, what exactly was promised? Well, first it was promised that he'd be the seed of the woman. Remember Genesis chapter 3. Then it keeps going. He'd be the seed of Abraham and Sarah. And one of the things that you notice as you go through the Old Testament, this is really the primary, one of the primary purposes of the Old Testament, especially the book of Genesis, is that the promise of seed starts out very large, very broad. And so you have, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, what's the seed of the woman? In a technical sense, it's every single person that lives now because, or that would be born because she's the mother of all living. So, I mean, that's broad. So, in essence, the promise there is that somewhere from your seed, there would come a Savior. The Messiah would come. The one who's going to crush the serpent would come from the populace of humanity. And then it narrows down through to Noah, and then it broadens back out, and then it comes down to Abraham and Sarah, and then it goes to Isaac, and you have the, the history of Isaac and Ishmael that's recorded there. And he chooses Isaac over Ishmael, and God chose Jacob over Esau. Judah, out of the 12 tribes, not the other 11 brothers, chose David and not the seven other brothers. So he keeps narrowing this down. And from David's sons, Nathan is chosen as the one through whom Jesus would come, as opposed to Solomon. Uh, there would be one nation, Israel, as opposed to the other nations, one of the 12 tribes, one family, David's, one small town, Bethlehem, and it, he would come in the fullness of time. God planned it out that at a particular time, Jesus would come, and he would come of a virgin named Mary. Bye-bye. So Jesus, let's look at these prophecies. It was prophesied that he would heal the sick, that he would be a light to the Gentiles, that he would be rejected and crucified, that his hands and feet would be pierced, that he would die and rise again, that he would give the Spirit to believers, he, that he would be cut off after 483 years. Remember the prof, the thing that we just finished on prophecy. Prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, that after the 483 years, from the time that the decree is signed to leave, uh, to leave Babylon, 483 years just after that, Messiah would be cut off. It was prophesied down to the year when he would come and be cut off. Notice this. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies about his life on earth. Now, what does that tell us? What does that give assurance to us about regarding his second coming? And he's going to fulfill those too. <laughs> I mean, every prophecy about the first coming of Jesus Christ was fulfilled to a T. It was fulfilled exactly, in extreme detail. And it's going to happen the same way with the second coming. Notice this. Proverbs chapter 30. You don't really expect to see a Christology and, or a study of Christ in Proverbs, but here's a good one. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the winds in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in, in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? Now from the Old Testament, what is his name? Jehovah, the name of God. Now watch this. And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. So even in the Old Testament, they understood that Jesus was the Son of God, even before he came to earth. And so he says this gospel is concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Now notice there it says he was made of the seed of David. He's not born after the seed of David. What's the difference? Because Jesus was preexistent. T take your Bible, go with me to the book of Hebrews for a moment. Hebrews chapter 2. Let's look at a couple of verses there in the book of Hebrews. This is very important how Paul words this. You know, and this is where we started, all Scripture. And the Bible tells us that every word of God is pure. And so we, we have the words. Every word is there on purpose. Nothing's there because God's just lacking something to say or just trying to fill up space and... Uh, kill an animal or a tree. I mean, it's there on purpose. And so he says he's made of the seed of David. Now watch this. Chapter 2 of Hebrews, verse number 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for what purpose? For the suffering of death. Okay, now this is so important. So if he's made lower than the angels, what does that mean about him prior to being made lower than the angels? That means at one point he was above the angels. 
let me ask you this. Lucifer, Satan, is an angelic being. He's a cherub. Now, it's interesting. In Mormonism and other religions, they think that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. That came as a result of the Heavenly Father and the Heavenly Mother. And, you know, there's this kind of battle. It's an oversimplification, but that's essentially what they believe. And it, according to this verse, Jesus was above the angels prior to his birth. He had always been eternal and above the angels. And it took a divine act, it took an act of God to make him lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Now, how did, how did that take place? Can God, is God flesh or is he a spirit? God is a spirit, the Bible says. So what does that require then in order for him to die? It requires that he take on flesh. Now notice down here in verse number 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So notice here, when Paul says Jesus was made of the seed of David, he was not naturally of the seed of David, he was not naturally of the seed of Abraham. It took a divine act where flesh, where he took on flesh and was made of the seed of David. And then notice here, what was that purpose for? To die. Here's some prophecies regarding his death. Psalm 22, 16 to 18. For dogs have compassed me. Now, when it's talking about dogs are in the context of Psalm 22, it's talking about the people that were mocking him at the cross. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, what's interesting about this is this is over 200 years before crucifixion became a thing. See, it was the Persians that developed the punishment of crucifixion. Uh, when we read the book of Esther, and it talks about uh, Haman making a gallows to hang Mordecai on, we think of gallows and we think of Wild West you know, lynching somebody. But in the Bible, when it talks about a gallows, a gallows is simply a wooden structure that they would nail somebody to to hang them. And that's what was going on there. Later on, the Romans would come around and develop this and make it <laughs> an extreme act of torture for somebody. But here we have this prophecy. Over 200 years before it was ever invented, and of course my computer would do something like that. So he says, they pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. All things they did at the cross. Here he says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. So there again, Jesus is pierced. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Isaiah 53. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because, of course, I don't know what happened there. Sorry, this is one of those technological things. I'll just read the verses here. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It means to crush him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So we have those prophecies of Christ's crucifixion. So Romans chapter 1 here, if you want to grab your Bible since it's not up there, not sure why that happened. Let me see this real quick. Sorry, this is terrible. Like I said, this is the first time I've done this. Nope, it's not going to work. There we go, I'll just do that, give you a blue screen. So it says there in Romans chapter 1 verse 4, he's declared to be the Son of God with power. So he was made of the seed of David. That's his humanity. Then he's declared to be the son. 
what is that talking about? It's talking about his deity. Because as a son of God, he's co-eternal, he's co-equal with God. He emanates from the Father. And he's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Notice this. How is he declared? By the resurrection from the dead. So this was the proof that he is, in fact, God, that everything that he said was true. The resurrection is so vital because if Jesus made all these promises, I'm going to forgive sins, I'm going to die on the cross, that's going to satisfy God's wrath, what good would it be if there was no resurrection? How would you ever know? I mean, we would be in the same place every other religion is wondering, is it actually true? This is why it was so important for Jesus when he shows up to the apostles and you have Thomas there and he says, I'm not going to believe unless I stick my hands and my fingers into the holes in his hands and I thrust my hand into his side. Why was that so important? Why does Jesus show up and he still has the wounds and he says, go ahead, do it. Do what you just said. Because, yeah, sure, somebody, if they have holes in their hands, they can survive. But to have that hole in his side that goes all the way to his heart, that's absolutely impossible. The only way to explain that is that he is God and that he is resurrected from the dead. Acts chapter 2, verse 24, Peter says, it was not possible that he should be holden of death. Why is that? Because he's God. You can't keep him down. In fact, Jesus even tells us to beware in Matthew chapter 16. Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. See, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And so when Jesus made the claims of being resurrected, they wouldn't believe it. And so he warns us, beware of that leaven. Beware of that teaching. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So it's... Is it important that Jesus rose again? Yes. But it's equally as important that he appeared to witnesses. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to all 12 apostles together, which would be Matthias included, because Judas is already dead at this point. He appears to 500 brethren at one time. I mean, that's more than just a hallucination of a couple people. To have 500 people have the exact same testimony. Yes, I saw him. This is what he looked like. This is what he did. And then Paul says, and the greater part of them are still alive. Go ask them. Go talk to them. Get their account. And that's probably where Luke got some of his information. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, in verse 3, he says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. He didn't just appear to them. It says, By many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days. So for 40 days, Jesus performed various miracles to verify. You know, he's not just a spirit that rose. He's actually doing these things. So it was evident now, 3,000 people believe the first day the church started. Go After from his resurrection, go 50 days later, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people believed that first day. They heard the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believed they were baptized and added to the church. And then, let me see here. Let's, let's stop there. I'll just add this into next week. We'll do that. I can do that, right? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time you've given to us. Lord, thank you for the word of God and for the truth that it presents to us. Thank you for the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus that we have. And Father, I pray that you'd help us, like the early church, to be fervent, to really glory and understand how great a truth it is that you died and rose again for us. And since you're alive, we have hope of eternity. And I pray that we'd be faithful and zealous to get the gospel to people. Please bless now as we prepare for the next hour. In Jesus' name, amen.